Seminarau ar lein adran y Gymraeg a Gastudiaethau Celtaidd, Prifysgol Aberystwyth. Dr. Ben Gai, New Light on the Gododdin, y deddegfed o hydref 2021, the 12th of October 2021. Iawn, wel nos a pawb, a chroeso i chi gyd i i'r seminar heno, sef y gyntaf mewn cyfres o seminarau um, gan Abdran y Gymraeg a Gastudiaeth y Celtaidd yma yn Aberystwyth. Um, good evening and welcome to you all. I'm very pleased to see so many of you here for the first in our series of seminars here at the Department of Welsh and Celtic Studies in uh, Aberystwyth. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome uh, tonight uh, to speak to us uh, Dr. Ben Guy, uh, who is a teaching assistant in the Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of Robinson College, Cambridge. Um, he, his research interests uh, range across early in insular history, medieval historical writing, Welsh manuscripts, a medieval Welsh language and literature. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with his uh, excellent recent book on medieval Welsh genealogy. Um, and he uh, tells me that he's presently preparing a new edition and translation of the Historia Bretonum, which is a, a formidable um, challenge. Um, uh, but tonight he's going to talk to us about uh, the Godovin, and he promises to shed new light on it. So um, we're all uh, very excited to hear uh, what he has to say about that. Welcome, Ben. Diolch, Simon. Uh, Adiolch, mawr iawn i chi gyd am ddod heddiw. Mae'n hyfryd iawn uh, i weld cymaint o bobl uh, yma uh, heno. Um, let me share the screen. Um, there we go. I'll assume unless someone shouts that uh, you can now see the PowerPoint. Um, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much and uh, really lovely to see uh, everybody here uh, today. Um, I, I noticed actually that in the transition uh, between the email chain uh, uh, between me and Simon to the, the poster that's been uh, circulating widely on social me media that the crucial question mark in my title uh, was, uh, was omitted in uh, transmission. So I, I reinstated it here uh, in the PowerPoint just to emphasize that what I'll be talking about today uh, is a, a tentative idea really that I'm presenting here uh, for the first time. So th this is the kind of a trial run as it were uh, of this particular idea and I'll be very interested at the end to uh, hear uh, what you all think of it. So um, this is the uh, structure of the presentation. Um, we'll begin by uh, thinking about some of the general problems associated with the Gadodin, not that I think I need to introduce it uh, very much to this particular audience, um, but thinking in particular about its relationship with the Northern Britons of the early uh, Middle Ages. Uh, and then secondly, and, and apologies to those of you who thought you were going to see a, a presentation by me that actually didn't include uh, genealogies, I'm afraid they will in fact be, uh, be present. Uh, we'll be thinking about the uh, Gwyr Gogledd um, in the Old Welsh genealogies and what they tell us about the ways in which the men of the North were being thought about in the 9th and 10th centuries in Wales. And then thirdly, we'll um, look at the, I suppose, the key argument that I'll be making uh, in this seminar this evening, that uh, among the uh, royal genealogies, one of them uh, pertains to the Godobin, uh, and it is this that um, I would argue might shed um, some new light on the poetry more broadly. Um, Okay, so to begin with then, um, Agdodin and the Northern Britons, um, I suppose emphasising some aspects of the poetry that I think are sometimes uh, neglected or overlooked. So it won't surprise uh, people in this audience to hear that there are uh, one or two problems when it comes to uh, aspects of the interpretation uh, of the Gadodin, uh, despite the heroic efforts of uh, people such as the, uh, the authors of these various books, offering texts and translations of varying kinds and with different uh, approaches over the past century or so. Um, obviously, uh, the uh, most significant problem is one of uh, dates, which has uh, traditionally been construed as the question whether or not some parts of the poetry, at least, 
um, stem from the time that it concerns, namely the late 6th or early 7th centuries. Um, although, in fact, the work question of dating is more complicated than that, because it's generally agreed, I think, really by everyone um, nowadays, um, that what we have here is not, not really a single text, so much as a series of interrelated um, texts that were um, uh, accumulated over time, uh, which uh, interlock with one another and address a series of interrelated themes. And of course, as soon as you uh, entertain the idea of multiple texts, you suddenly have a, a plethora of, uh, of dates to work uh, with, and not only for the composition of different, uh, different texts, but also for their reworking uh, over time. Um, with regard to uh, questions of uh, transmission, the, the key problem, I suppose, is how we get from uh, the uh, early Middle Ages, when some of this, or maybe all of this material, was putatively composed, to the 13th century manuscript um, and um, that it is preserved in, uh, written in North Wales uh, in, in the 13th century. And a key part of that um, problem, as it has often been discussed, is whether if some of this poetry was actually composed by uh, Britons in the north, and um, how then did it uh, was it transmitted to Wales? And I'll be saying a bit more about that uh, in a moment. Although uh, I'll just say um, for now that I don't think this is really uh, as big a problem as some of the uh, elaborate theories have um, have made of it in the past. All of this, of course, has a, a, a very significant bearing on the the context or contexts in the plural. Um, uh, in which this poetry could be understood, either being generated, being reworked, being performed or read, um, because uh, we have so little information on it, aside from what we can deduce from, um, from criticism of the poetry itself. And it's really the interpretation at the end of this chain uh, that then uh, is kind of hanging in the air if we have to do anything uh, but a strictly a historicist type of uh, approach. So lots of problems, and I'm not really going to be um, solving any of them today, sadly, but um, I will be hopefully offering uh, just a new way of, uh, of thinking about um, this, which might add an additional um, dimension to it. Um, now, when it comes to um, the dating, as I said, this has been traditionally con construed as being 6th century or not 6th century, and I think sometimes in that debate, what we can uh, forget is that whether or not any of it goes back quite that far, there are still substantial parts of it that are pretty old, by uh, by general Welsh standards. Um, in other words, this, this is poetry which does uh, properly belong to the Hengerth, uh, which um, predates 1100, and indeed much of it probably predates the uh, 11th century. Uh, and just to give an, an example, a very familiar example to those of you who know about the Gadoddin and scholarship on the Gadoddin, um, there's an example here um, concerning one particular poem within the Book of Aneirin, uh, traditionally thought of as being somewhat separate from the main body of poetry, although um, very much uh, on theme, as it were, um, uh, with the rest of the corpus. And this is a poem concerning the Battle of Strathcarran that happens in 642. And we have two versions of the stanza, stanza preserved, what are known as the A text and the B text. And these are then the, the, the versions of the text written out by different scribes in the Book of Aneirin, who each seem to have had access to a different written exemplar uh, which often uh, preserve common material to, to an extent between them. And there are various reasons to think that the, um, the, the archetype of these two versions uh, was uh, quite old. And uh, to my mind, I think the, the most uh, convincing of them is just the bits I've highlighted here in uh, bold, uh, which in the A text reads, Aguir Noithon and, and the men of Noithon. And in the B text uh, reads, or Eir Noithon, um, by, the, by the word of Noithon, presumably. Um, but given that we know that this battle historically was won by somebody who was, who was actually the grandson of somebody called Noithon or Nathan, uh, it has been uh, posited before that um, what we originally had here in, uh, in an, an, an archetypal written copy was uh, Oyer Noithon, the grandson of Noithon, and that the misinterpretations or reinterpretations that we see here arose because that word was spelt E-R. Um, and the important thing about that for dating purposes is that so far as we can tell, the spelling of E for the diphthong OI had fallen out of use by about 800. So um, if that kind of chain of, uh, of suppositions does hold up, and it seems uh, reasonable to me, then uh, that would tell us that there, is a, a, there was a common written archetype behind these two uh, versions, which was in writing uh, round about by uh, 800. It doesn't necessarily mean that this poem was composed as early as, as 642, and nor does it necessarily have any bearing upon the rest of the poetry in the manuscript. It's simply to make the point that, um, that uh, there is poetry within this manuscript that is pretty old 
even if it's very difficult to try and actually push it back as far as the sixth and seventh centuries with definitive evidence. Um, and then with regard to uh, questions of transmission, the thing I just wanted to highlight uh, really in this presentation, and, and you'll see why I'm, I'm doing this later on, is if we are to think of um, some version or versions of the Gadothin corpus existing pre-1100, pre-11th century, as I think even the, the most hardline skeptics would be happy to agree on, on, on some level, then we are immediately getting back into a world where, um, uh, where we shouldn't be thinking of this as poetry of the Welsh or poetry of, of, of Wales, but rather of the Britons, because this was a time period, at least when, in terms of ethnicity, and culture, Britons were thinking of themselves very much as a single people, whether they lived in the North or in the West. Uh, and this is certainly uh, the case from uh, the Irish perspective, for example, uh, in this period. Um, I've listed here a few uh, entries from the Annals of Ulster for the 9th and 10th centuries, just to make the point that from an Irish perspective, um, the two primary lines of uh, uh, royal lines of the Britons during this period were those ruling Gwynedd and those ruling Strathclyde in the North. Um, often both of them were just called uh, Rex Britonum in these contexts, King of the Britons. Sometimes the Kings of Strathclyde were distinguished with some of the terms you can see here, King of the Britons of Strathclyde, uh, King of the Northern Britons, as well as simply being just King of the Britons. We can get a, an insight into the ways in which these things were being thought about in the vernacular in the 10th century by looking at Adam's Prodine Vaud, which as I'm sure many of you know is, is rather full of interesting um, terminology for the different peoples of Britain and Ireland. This is where we get the first um, uh, fairly securely datable uh, vernacular instance of the term uh, Cymru, um, although the uncertainty is whether this refers just to the Cymru of Wales or to the Cymru more broadly. In other words, is, it, is this just being used as a, as a vernacular synonym for the Britons? We know, of course, that Northern Britons also called themselves Cymru because this gave rise to uh, Cumbria and Cumberland and so on, uh, and that kind of terminology. Nevertheless, there were uh, words for uh, Britons of particular geographical areas, as you can see a couple of lines later, Cornu referring to uh, Cornwall, and Clidwis, of course, referring to the um, uh, Britons of uh, Strathclyde, those northern Britons. And then, of course, after that, Bruth on there, possibly as another general term. A few lines down in the poem, though, very interestingly, we have reference to the Gwir Gogleth, seemingly separately from the Clidwis or, or other people up there. Um, this seems to be a reference to not only Britons of the North, but legendary Britons of the North, Britons um, uh, whom one would have encountered in poetry, in story, in legend, uh, much as it survives to us in, an, in a fragmentary form today. So the distinction being made within this particular poem isn't between um, uh, really Northern Britons and Britons of Wales, so much as Britons of the legendary past in the North and contemporary Britons who lived in various parts of the island of Britain. Uh, so this is something which we need to, uh, I think, bear in mind in terms of the way that they were thinking about um, Northerners, both past and indeed present uh, within the 9th and 10th centuries. Um, sometimes I think the when, when thinking about a Northern context for the Gadothin, um, we only really think about it in terms of the 6th or 7th centuries. But of course, Britons didn't stop to exist in the North um, uh, beyond that time period. And um, you know they continued to, to, to live there, to speak uh, a Britonic language, um, probably very close to Welsh, although we have very little record of it. And indeed, within the Kingdom of Strathclyde, they uh, continued to exist under their own kings. And no doubt throughout this time period, there was interchange of, of literature, both in oral and written form. And one could very easily imagine, I think, in this kind of context, um, copies of the Gadovin or uh, already spoken versions of Gadovin poetry being transmitted among them, which is not to say that it, that is certainly how it worked, but that I don't think it's really an obstacle. In the same way that in, in the later Middle Ages, if we find a poem composed in North Wales popping up in a manuscript in South Wales, it's not really a problem because literature travelled in, in different ways, which are almost always impossible to get at now. And um, if we are to get ourselves into the mindset of this period, we need to think about a, a somewhat broader literary community than one existing solely within Wales. Okay, so that's um, some blurb, I suppose, about the background of the Gadothin, hopefully the import of which will soon become apparent. But um, let us momentarily leave the um, Gadothin to think about uh, another um, important and detailed source of information for Gwir Gogleth in this time period, namely the Old Welsh genealogies. 
Uh, what I'm talking about primarily here is the Harleian genealogies. Uh, these are preserved in an Anglo-Norman manuscript, probably written in Kent in the southeast of England, around about the year 1100. It's a large uh, miscellany containing various texts, mainly of classical origin. But one section of the manuscript was copied from a Welsh exemplar, which itself seems to have been written in Wales, probably in St. David's around the year 954 or shortly thereafter. Um, the, the Welsh section, as it were, contains the Historia Britonum, the Welsh Annals, uh, and the genealogies in, in a single uh, bundle. Um, the genealogies are mostly written in 10th century Old Welsh, by which I mean uh, Old Welsh uh, written using the kinds of spellings one would expect of the 10th century, although some, ter some terminology and phrases are written in, in Latin, as again one would expect of this period. And uh, these genealogies um, uh, as a whole do not concern Wales. It's, it would be, again, a later way of thinking to think that they are really about Wales. Rather, they are about the Britons of the West and the North, um, or what we would now think of as the Britons of Wales and the Old North. Um, more particularly, um, the text is concerned with the Britons of Mid Wales, North Wales, and then everything north of that. There's far more about the north of, um, of, of Britain broadly in, in here than there is about South Wales, Cornwall, or Brittany. This is very much Britons of the West and North from a generally um, Northern uh, Britonic perspective. Um, the Northern uh, section of it is one of the better organized um, parts of the text. And I've, what I've done in these two diagrams is lay out the uh, individual pedigrees in, in the order in which they occur in the text from section five there, you can see on the left through to uh, initially section 12 there on the right, which is where the continuous sequence ends. And then there's a, an outlier section 19 uh, a bit further onto the, the right there. You can see immediately that the, the northerners, as it were, are arranged into two clear families. There is the uh, descendants of Dovenwal Hain on the left there, and the descendants of Coyle Hain on the right. The only line that goes uh, so far forwards in time, as it were, uh, as the time at which these, this material was being compiled is the first uh, lineage, not coincidentally, this one down here, which concerns the rulers of Strathclyde uh, in the late ninth century, uh, traced back to, to the earlier rulers of Dumbarton uh, back into the legendary past. So we know that Athal here died in 872. Uh, we saw his obituary in the Irish Annals a moment ago, and, um, and his son Hryn was presumably uh, in power around the time when this pedigree was compiled. Thereafter, all the other um, uh, lines, as it were, concerned people that the poet of Admas Prodheimval would no doubt have termed Gwir Gogleth. In other words, not contemporary Northerners, as Finn Abarthal was, but rather Northerners of the legendary past, whom they would have known through stories, literature, and so on, such as the famous story uh, preserved in the ninth century Historia Britonum, uh, describing the four kings who fought against the Northumbrians, namely Irian, Rhaen, Gwashog, and Morgan. And indeed, the pedigrees of those four particular kings are those that are given here under section six, eight, nine, and ten. Uh, by no means coincidentally, of course, considering that this is a, a collection of genealogies literally inserted inside a copy of Historia Britonum. Um, the purpose here of re-juxtaposing this first one, um, section number five, with the rest of them is that it, it relates very clearly to a genealogically minded uh, Welsh audience, the relationship between past and present, not in terms of the enumeration of years, but the enumeration of generations going back in time. They knew how many generations before the present uh, kings of Strathclyde, the, the legendary figures of the literature were active. Um, so uh, you can see that the, the Gwyr Gogles, as it were, are not separated from the, the Clidwis, in other words, the contemporary rulers of Strathclyde, either by family, because some of them are in the same family, uh, or by geography, um, because these are all occupying broadly the same space. It, it's really by time, um, and I suppose, um, therefore, the implications that has as to what they were um, thought to be doing. That there was a specifically uh, literary approach to this type of material, even here in this genealogical context, is shown by some of the names and epithets, which I think we have to assume uh, would have arisen or at least been explained um, through stories at the time. Uh, so, for example, uh, Gwaslaug over here, well known as the subject of some, uh, some of the Taliesin poems, uh, his grandfather is this, uh, this guy, Maswig uh, Glorf, it seems, the, the lame. Uh, his uh, cousin there is Dovenwal Voilvid, 
seemingly the bald and the mute. Um, he had a grandson over here, Morgan Volch, the, the gappy, presumably, or something like that. Uh, and then best of all is the, the grandfather over here of Gorgi and Peredir, um, who is just called Sledloom in this, the, the kind of ragged, the ragged one. Um, so uh, presumably, originally, there were stories to explain why these people had these um, somewhat comical or farcical epithets. Um, uh, although, of course, these haven't haven't survived to us. But it, it tells us something about the context and, and the ways in which these people were being thought about already even in the 9th and 10th centuries. OK, so that's some background on the genealogies. Finally, let's turn to the Gadovin. And uh, the main argument I'll be advancing here is that um, another of the, uh, the lineages recorded in the Harleian genealogies uh, may pertain to a royal dynasty of the Gadovin, which itself, as I'll uh, suggest, has implications for how we read parts of the poetry. The text that we'll be concerned with is uh, section 16, uh, one of the obscurer uh, and longer sections in the manuscripts. Although the reason for its length is that it's really two sections of text that have been spliced together, either deliberately or accidentally, I don't know. Uh, I'm showing the, the point of transition here in the manuscript, and you can see it just runs on straight onto the, um, the orange part of the text, as it were, without a break. So it's at some point in the history of this text where these two things were combined together. So what we have here is a text that starts off, as most of the others do, with uh, Britonic-looking names going back in time, uh, presumably belonging to some royal dynasty, because that's the way that these things work. But then very suddenly we get to the orange text, and we've transitioned then to a list of Roman emperors going back in time, um, starting with Constans here, some of Constantine the Great, uh, all the way back in time to Augustus Caesar, with various notes interspersed outlining elements of Christian history. Um, so it's possible to tell where this, this Roman section came from. Um, this is uh, an image from a, a ninth century manuscript um, from Germany, but this is purely really for uh, illustrative purposes. Um, it's a manuscript of the Eusebius Jerome Chronicle, and the, the great parallel um, chronicle showing um, uh, the chronology of world history uh, aligned with biblical events. And manuscripts of that uh, chronicle during the early Middle Ages travelled around, appended with various lists of rulers, including a list of Roman emperors. And it is just such a list that was the source um, for the, uh, the Roman section of that Welsh genealogy. We can tell this in two ways, firstly because of the names that have been selected for inclusion, which is not every single Roman emperor, merely a, a kind of liberal selection of them, and the same selection you get in this list, but also because some of the corrupt name forms that occur in the Welsh genealogy um, uh, arise from misreadings of, of this king list format um, of, uh, on this page, as you can see outlining the numbers of years and months that these various emperors ruled, and this accounts for some of the odder spellings in the Harleian genealogies. It's no great surprise that this kind of thing would have been available to somebody um, in Wales in the 9th or 10th centuries. Uh, for example, the uh, Historia Britonum, written in 829 or 830, um, makes very uh, frequent use of the Eusebius Jerome Chronicle, and it was a, it was a well-known uh, text in the early Middle Ages. So for some reason that we is now lost to us, um, this was converted into a pedigree within Wales and then for other reasons lost to us, it was then attached um, to this other uh, Welsh or Britonic lineage. Um, so for the re remainder of this talk, I won't be referring or talking about the, uh, the Roman appendage, as it were, uh, to this line, uh, although it may, it may prove relevant um, in the end. So what are we left with then? Well, we're left with a sequence of names, uh, none of which are immediately familiar to us, even though the, the names themselves are, are, are broadly possible um, uh, it's, it's probably possible to understand what the names are. Nevertheless, uh, and gratifyingly, um, the line, the pedigree, does fall into the, uh, the familiar pattern of sections that one would expect um, from pedigrees of this type, as seen elsewhere in the Harleian genealogies. So we begin with a slightly longer list of names that are, are real names and are, are familiar to us from other contexts, and presumably belonged uh, to a historical uh, person called Trinson of Nathan, and these are the ancestors that and he claimed at a certain time. We then reach an extremely obscure section with these completely unknown names. And if anyone knows what uh, Degian or Kinnis Scablaud mean, uh, please do let me know. But then, as, uh, as so often with these types of um, uh, pedigrees, we reach back into a kind of legendary 
time period when the names once again become familiar, less corrupt looking, and are known to us not from a historical context necessarily, but from a kind of legendary one instead. So here we have uh, in the old Welsh orthography, Shehen, son of Gwydion, and it's been noted in the past, these names clearly bear some kind of uh, resemblance at least uh, towards uh, Lleishal Gafes and Gwydion, although um, exactly what that resemblance is, uh, is, is anyone's guess really. And certainly this form here, Gwydion, isn't exactly the same as Gwydion, but there's a suggestive uh, resemblance. And then similarly, as we'll be talking about a bit more in a moment, um, this sequence of names, Caradal, Convelin and Telhant, uh, is familiar to us from another context as well. So what I'm going to do now is take this section by section and think about why we might relate this or bits of it uh, to the Gadolin as a people and to the, uh, the, the poetry in the Book of Anarim. So to begin with um, the first section first, so uh, as I mentioned before, the natural interpretation of this pedigree is that this is the, uh, the lineage of a, uh, a king called Shrin, son of Nathan. The important thing about those two names, Shrin and Nathan, is that they are notably Northern Britonic names that one usually finds in Northern contexts. For example, both names are used regularly uh, and repeatedly by the rulers of Alclede or Dumbarton, and indeed the name Nathan or Noithon, and we don't know whether they're genuine uh, variant names or whether this is in fact a, a, a orthographical variation within the Welsh corpus. And that name may be uh, originally a Pictish name and certainly recurs uh, very frequently among the Pictish royal family, uh, Nectans and the Derali, for example, most famously. Um, and of course, it's not, not a surprise, therefore, that we find these names uh, in the Book of Anairin, um, which is not the same as to say that the, the instances in the Book of Anairin are the same people mentioned in the pedigree, merely that it reinforces the, the northern context for these types of names. So, for example, one of the more uh, archaic stanzas uh, in the uh, in the Gadodin, um, in the B text, poem 26 here, um, concerns a certain Heniv, uh, son of Noithon, it seems, uh, while in the obscure Gwarchan Malveru, um, here using making use of Graham Isaac's translation, we have reference to a Gogled Hrin, um, seemingly a Hrin of the North, again, making the connection with the North uh, all the more explicit. We do find the two names occurring together in uh, Canitaliasin poem 12, um, concerning the uh, perhaps seemingly northern British enemies of uh, Gwasaug, and these lines, Gosobdesk of Gavrez, Gulazon Shiaus, Trinanid, Noithon. He repelled the joint assaults of the numerous champions, and then either namely or of Hrin and Neve and Noithon. So again, not necessarily the same people as one finds uh, in the pedigree, um, but at least we're in generally the right ballpark. These are northern uh, names with the implication that uh, this is the lineage of a northern person. Moving on a little bit, um, we then come to this mysterious name and almost unique name within the Welsh genealogical corpus, Serwan. Um, this name is not commonly found among the Britons. Um, it derives from Latin uh, Serwandus, Serwandus, and is most prominently born, I suppose, by Saint Serf of Culross. And I, I'm showing here on the map uh, the location of Culross Abbey. A significant point for our purpose, I suppose, is that the 12th century, probably 12th century, life of Saint Serf claims an area equivalent to what we might think of as Manal Gadovin um, for the territory of the saints familiar, giving you there the, uh, the Latin text, um, which is thought to refer essentially to this uh, area, uh, broadly speaking. So why is that significant? Well, um, again, I'm not suggesting that we have Saint Serf himself here in the pedigree, but nevertheless, it is the case that in the pedigrees of early medieval rulers, the names of prominent regional uh, saints do crop up. Uh, for example, um, a, a common name among the early medieval rulers of Dyved was Cathen. And of course, then it's no surprise that within the bounds of early medieval Dyved was San Gathen and indeed the commodes of Cathaniok. And I wonder whether something um, comparable is really going on here uh, with this name at Serwa. Um, but all that is really only suggested. It's, it's when we get back to sections three and four that I think we have more uh, specific and maybe more persuasive indications that this uh, lineage might have something to do with the Gadolin. First of all, we should notice the uh, occurrence of this epithet Hain here, attached to this name, which is an old Welsh spelling for what we now, would now say is Llei. Um, we saw when we looked at the, uh, the northern um, uh, pedigrees elsewhere uh, in this collection of genealogies, that the epithet Hain was being used to denote 
um, significant northern patriarchs who were the, uh, the kind of originary ancestors of some key northern lineages, namely Dovenwal Hairn and Coyle Hairn. Well, the occurrence of the same epithet in this context should alert us to the potential importance of this name Shay as an ancestral figure within this line, an ancestor of this character, Trin, son of, um, of Nathan. Um, it's been claimed uh, in the past by uh, Patrick Ford, for instance, that in these types of contexts, the epithet Hairn might have the specific uh, connotation of ancestor. That's not necessarily correct, but that doesn't mean that the general principle that this was an epithet applied to um, kind of key ancestral figures um, doesn't follow through. I think this is an important uh, feature. And it should encourage us to suppose that it is an, it is an important feature because of the uh, recurrence of the name or word say in reference to the Gadogat, most prominently perhaps in this stanza at the beginning of which you can see here on the slide. This is the stanza that is the subject of Graham Isaac's important study down here, Canyon Nerun Audel 51. Um, this is uh, a particular um, poem that occurs three times within the book of a Nerun. Um, the three versions of it seem to stem from a single uh, original written archetype. And the important thing about it is that um, it seems to, this particular uh, poem seems to have stood at the head of one or more early written copies of the Gadogin, implying therefore that it is a poem of some significance. Well, these are the first um, lines of the poem uh, as rendered in the most archaic version uh, of the three that survive of this uh, poem, uh, which read here, Llech lleidid a ti llevra Gadogin stre stre angat, um, which is uh, translatable as something like the rock of a bright people or a Llech's people, the people of a bright hill or Llech's hill, Godovin's borderland, holder of the borderland, or possibly the borderland was held. Um, so we clearly have repeated use here of this term say, um, the most obvious interpretations of which in this context would either, either be as an adjective meaning bright or as the personal name say. Although in this type of context, of course, in Welsh poetry, whenever we uh, come across this type of obvious ambiguity, I think we should always uh, assume at first, at least, that the poets intended the ambiguity to be there. This, this is part of the of the image that was trying to be uh, that he was trying to evoke. And um, so, uh, in this context, clearly, um, "slay" is be, is important. And even if uh, we might understand the adjective "bright," clearly, some uh, some audience members listening to this uh, this poem in the past could just as easily have understood the personal name "slay," and there might well then be a significant reason. Uh, why Slay was being applied to the people and to a particular hill, putatively then the people of the Gadovin and uh, the most prominent uh, hill fort within the Gadovin, which is of course uh, Edinburgh. Now, this has been noticed before, and I think particularly by Thomas Charles Edwards in Wales and the Britons, but this might have something to do with the, uh, the name of the region thereabouts, namely Lothian. Um, Lothian uh, is a name with an obscure etymology that I don't propose to solve here today, um, but we do have um, certain early-ish uh, attestations of it from a kind of Britonic point of view. Um, firstly, in the anonymous uh, Life of St. Kentigan, written for Bishop Herbert of Glasgow in the middle of the 12th century, and this is a text which um, has some uh, Britonic uh, sources and which is at least very keen to uh, promote the Britonic origins of the Diocese of Glasgow, as Glasgow generally was in the 12th century, um, to uh, emphasise its independence from the neighbouring uh, dioceses of, of St Andrews and York. The form we get in this uh, text is Leodonia, that's how you say that. Um, quite similarly, and around the same time, Gwachmai Meiler in his uh, God Hoffez has the line Tra Llu Llevinion Drevid, um, homesteads of Llevinion beyond the hill, we don't know exactly which shoe this refers to, but this probably is another reference to Lothian. Um, and I think this is the only occurrence of this form of Lothian in a medieval Welsh context. And the, uh, it's been noted before, for example, by Margaret Haycock in this uh, piece below, um, that the, the yawn suffix here is something which is only otherwise attached to personal names in the names of regions. So Keredigion, for example, um, uh, and the personal name Keredig implying that in this instance, Slavin here was a personal name. Nevertheless, the comparison between Slavin here and Leodonia, as well as um, the obvious uh, interpretation of it as referring to a place, specifically a din or a kind of hill fort or something, um, I think it should encourage us to think that the that Slavin here 
is originally a, a place name, which for whatever reason, either by Gwalchmai or somebody else, has been reinterpreted in such a way as that it was uh, given the suffix uh, yawn and rendered in this particular uh, context. Um, this might have just been a kind of uh, poeticization of a pre-existing place name. Well, if so, um, the, oops, sorry, um, the place name um, say then um, uh, uh, would clearly have meant to a contemporary audience, either Bright's Fortress or Shay's Fortress. Um, and this needn't have been the real etymology of it. The important point would be that to anyone who knew a Britonic language, and particularly Welsh, uh, in this uh, time period, could easily have interpreted this name as including uh, as including Shay. And so um, I think drawing these um, dots together, we could, I think, um, conclude that that first uh, important stanza in an early written copy of the Gododin was kind of uh, playing around with the name uh, of the local province by referring to Shay Deed and Shay Vre and so on. And that um, the, this, the, the provincial name might have either given rise to or indeed have been based on um, an ancestor of a local ruler, as is usually the case, again, with Keredigion, the local rulers of Keredigion thought they were descended from somebody called Keredig. Much in the same way, the local, local rulers of this area probably thought that they were descended from somebody called Clay, um, which could well then be the significance of Clay here and here in the, uh, the genealogy. Within section three, though, it's not only Clay who has a, a part to play in this, uh, this story. Um, also, Gwythian occurs in two uh, uh, possibly significant contexts um, in the uh, uh, the uh, so-called historical poems of Cani, uh, of Taliesin. Um, so firstly here in poem seven, this part of which uh, concerns Irian's battles and various enemies, so presumably those that he was successful against. So uh, for example here in the first line here, we have uh, Irian seemingly fighting before Poes, and the poet commenting that the supposedly fierce lineage of Gerois, if we interpret that as a personal name, was in fact not so fierce, presumably when uh, confronted with Gideon. The Gadol didn't crop up here in a much less than clear way, sadly, in this line, have I a Gadol in a say Dois, have I possibly meaning a bold one in reference to Gideon, although what a Gadol really means is I think very unclear. I mean, it looks like it means and Gadol um, but that doesn't make a great deal of sense. And in any case, Ilian isn't usually associated with the Gadovin, um, pretty consistently so. And so one wonders if this means something like with respect to the Gadovin. And again, it's listing another people or place like Poets that Ilian habitually fought against. Um, it may be no coincidence, though, given the way that poets play around with things, that later in this same line, this word say uh, crops up again, um, seemingly in reference to Ilian as a maybe a bright. Uh, leader, but possibly there's an association that the uh, poet is playing with, with between Shay and Gadodin. But the name Gwithen or Gwithien crops up a few lines later here uh, in this particular line, Divevel um, Divoin Ungwide Gwithen, um, which probably means something like flawlessly seizing, so presumably plundering, Ungwide uh, Gwithen, so in the blood of, uh, of Gwithen. Um, probably meaning, I think, among the uh, the bloodline of, of Gwyden. Gwyde, of course, being uh, often used as a metaphor for the descendants of. Um, so that, that's how I would interpret this line as referring to the descendants of Gwyden as people who were being plundered by Irian, implying that Gwyden was considered by this poet to be a particularly significant ancestor. Uh, we'll note in, just in passing, really, that the uh, this name Cadler was occurs up here as well. Um, also recurs a bit later on in this poem, although I don't know if that's really significant or not. Qui then appears again in another of the poems to Ilian, this time poem number eight, a spale uh, taliesin, which ends with the four lines here shown on this slide. Firstly, with two fairly typical taliesin style lines, if I should be favoured, I will make the world's poets happy. And then two lines that I've rendered here as before, Qui then's sons go to their deaths, Ilian is the leader, of the blessed country's hosts. And um, there are various ways that these lines could be construed. And indeed, others have wondered whether this phrase down here, Gwaladur Gwaith Gwenulad, refers in opposition to Gwyden. Although personally here, given that this is a poem to Irian, I prefer the last line actually to refer back to Irian again. And what I think this is saying is essentially until Gwyden's sons are, are dead, um, Irian will kind of go on being the, the leader of the country's host. 
And once again, it's not Gwydan himself who is being evoked here, but the maid Gwydan, uh, Gwydan's son, probably meaning uh, descendants um, figuratively um, again. So uh, we have then here an ancestral figure called Gwydan uh, being evoked in, in clearly a northern context, and seemingly um, his descendants were habitual enemies of Irian, which isn't to say that they would definitely belong to the Gedogan, but I think would be consonant with the interpretation of this uh, lineage, certainly as belonging to uh, a line of northern rulers, and uh, quite possibly to um, the Gedogan. So when we reach section four then, we get another um, more specific yet tantalizing uh, connection between uh, this lineage and the Gedogan. And that's with these three names here, Kuladaug, Mab Kenvelin, Mab Telhwant. Um, it's been noted before and remarked upon before that these seem to be the same names and the same relationships as uh, Karatikas, son of Cunubelinus, son of Tasciavanus of the Cat of Valauni, of course, the, um, the late Iron Age um, rulers of the Britons from the southeast of, of Britain, um, who, of course, fought against the Romans uh, and, and so on. Um, so that, it's remarkable in itself that these people um, occur here in this pedigree. But what's all the more uh, remarkable is that this form seemingly rendering Tasciavanus should occur here, because Tasciavanus is not known from any ancient written sources, but in fact is only known from his coins, such as the one um, uh, noted on the slide here. So whereas with the first two names one could suppose, as one does with these things, that the names were plucked at some stage from a classical historical text, it's not quite so easy to make the same assumption when it comes to Tasio Varnas. Um, moreover, the form we get here in the genealogies um, seems to have um, come about through the natural um, uh, development of this name uh, within spoken language, as was um, argued uh, in this piece by John Cook and, and others have since uh, agreed with him, although it, it, is, it is difficult to, um, to make the connection, but it does appear uh, plausible. So it's quite remarkable in and of itself that this should be here in the genealogy and does imply some sort of connection um, through um, or tradition one supposes, um, through a, a large span of time. This isn't the same thing as to say, though, that the person who put together this um, pedigree was thinking of these people in that kind of context. And um, for all that person might have known, these might have just been three legendary rulers with potentially different connotations, we don't know. Um, uh, but their connections are nevertheless tantalizing. The link with the Gedodin, though, of course, arises with Gwarchan, Convelin. This is one of this group of uh, very tricky poems found uh, uh, in the Book of Aneirin, seemingly as kind of appendices um, to the, um, the Gdodin. And the reason why I think we should probably suppose that this is the same Convelin uh, concerned, Kuno Belinos, in other words, in origin, um, is this line here, Edmugir Ivab um, Tehwan, something, which um, Ivor Williams um, thought should be corrected to Mab, um, resulting then from a misreading of three uh, minims as, as being Ivab. And that seems to be have been generally uh, accepted since then, um, meaning that the line would be translated as uh, Tehwan's son is honoured, um, and thereby very explicitly connecting um, this convey into the person that we know from history, although again, they didn't necessarily um, understand this character in the same way. And certainly with the sequence of names that we find here in the pedigree. So what is this poem doing in the manuscripts and what does it have to do with the Gedodin? Well, um, sadly, of course, um, all the relevant lines are obscure and in some cases, extremely difficult to, uh, to work out. Uh, one relevant section is this one, but um, uh, everyone else has opted not to translate, which tells you something about it, uh, including Jackson and Jadman. Um, but it begins here with uh, the song of Convelin, Gorhan Convelin, the sentry on the boundary. Wise is the man of battle, Gwynedd his country, for some reason, and curiously. Um, uh, so that, that bit seems relatively clear. We then have a rather less clear bit, Dochianau Deur Dochianad. And then a reference uh, clearly to Edinburgh, which I've rendered here as Edinburgh's bright, bright blue resistors, although other renderings will be possible. And whether these um, resistors of Edinburgh were people who were fighting with Convelin or against Convelin, I have no idea, but I'm sure you could construe it uh, either way, should you wish to. But it's clearly some connection here uh, with Edinburgh and with the Gadolin. A few lines later, we have this um, bit Gwarchan Convelin ar Adolin, 
which is, uh, has often been interpreted in the past as referring to the poem. So the poem Barchank and Dalin appended to um, the Gedobin. Uh, although there are lots of other possibilities um, there, particularly once one takes into account older meanings of ar. So considering it could mean uh, against the Gedobin or in front of, before the Gedobin, uh, it's not really clear, but there's clearly some reason why the poet thinks Kandelin um, is somebody who should be discussed in a Gedobin context. Rather clearer, it seems, um, are the final lines of the poem as shown here. Um, which returns to a more familiar um, Godovin style. Three men in three score and three hundred went to the conflict of Katzreif, of the many who had hastened after the mead cups of cupbearers, except three, of course, none returned. Kanon and Kadreif and Kadlau, that name uh, again, uh, of Kadnant. And then this final line, Gwarchan Kir Kandelin Kovnovant, the song of the hosts of Kandelin of battle or, or of warlike um, Kandelin. Um, seemingly, it seems to me, um, more explicitly connecting the warriors of the Gedovin with Kandelin, um, uh, seemingly calling them the hosts of, uh, of Kandelin. Um, if that is true, um, that could well, of course, be the reason why this um, Gwarchan appears here in this manuscript, why Kandelin is being celebrated in this kind of context, because um, for some reason, for what, uh, at whatever time period, he was thought of as being an ancestral hero of the Gedovin. Again, um, uh, uh, agreeing with the idea that this lineage um, should be thought of as belonging to a royal line of the Gedovin. Although very interesting that apparently his land should also be Gwynedd, which also uh, very much agrees with uh, other parts of the, uh, the Gedovin where uh, men from Gwynedd crop up, crop up surprisingly frequently. So, um, to summarise then, uh, when parts of the Gedovin corpus were being written down, the Northern Britons existed both in reality and in legend. I think this is an important factor, sometimes overlooked in discussions of this, that Northern Britons uh, and, and their existence and their participation in this type of thing um, should be assumed to be a continued reality throughout the early Middle Ages up to about the 11th century. Secondly, in the 9th or 10th century Holly and genealogies, the genealogies of Northern Britons are arranged in such a way as to relate the present to the legendary storied past through the enumeration of generations, separating them through time rather than um, through, um, through genealogy or through space. It's time, which is the crucial thing. And then lastly, I, I've tried to argue that um, the 16th uh, genealogy in the Harley and genealogies, prior to its uh, Roman sex section, uh, arguably relates to the Gedobin. Uh, because of the way that these things work in these types of um, early medieval genealogical collections, it implies that Hrin, son of Nathan, was at some stage considered to be a king of the Gedobin. If that is so, when would this have been? When would he have ruled? Well, we have no way at all of telling, um, but I think we should keep an open mind. Usually it's thought that the Gedobin as a kind of kingdom um, fell uh, fairly early in the seventh century. But really, I mean, there's not very good evidence uh, for that, aside from our kind of general sense of the growth of, um, of Anglian Benicia um, a little further to the, um, to the south and the east. And um, there could happily have been a king of the Gedobin called Trinstan and Nathan um, later in the seventh century, for example, I think, uh, based on the evidence that we have. Um, so, I suppose lastly then, uh, what effect does this have upon our reading of the Gedodin overall? Well, obviously it affects how we interpret particular um, uh, stanzas, as it were, or, or uh, particular sections uh, such as Gwarchan Kanvelin. But more broadly, I think it should encourage us to think of the range of ways in which the Gedodin were considered as a people, as a kingdom of the Northern Britons, um, within Wales and among the Britons during the early Middle Ages. They weren't solely the people who existed within the poetry, but arguably they were people who existed in other ways at this time to different people. If you had independent kings who weren't necessarily the subjects of the poetry, although some of them might uh, crop up uh, uh, hidden away amongst the many personal names uh, within the poetry. But I think it can, it can help us think of a broader range of contexts in which the poetry might have been of interest, composed, reworked, transmitted um, over time. Um, possibly in the north, uh, and certainly within Wales. Okay, I'll stop there and uh, very much look forward to any questions that anybody might have. Jochen Barriane.